Okay, so I'm going to wrap up objective three here and just continue on where that last video ended. So, again, this is a characteristic curve for um, our diode. Things we want to watch out for, again, our maximum uh, current rating, our uh, VRM rating, okay, because that will these will be at the expense of the diode, both of these ratings. So, again, forward bias is a point uh, where the curve is labeled IF max. Again, that's when we're forward biased, we have current going through. It represents the rated current or maximum continuous forward current of the diode. If the resistance of a circuit connected to the diode is too small, the current may be in excess of the IF max, causing overheating, which again potentially destroy it. So, we don't want to exceed that. Reverse bias limit is the maximum reverse voltage that can be applied to a diode. This limit may be called, again, the VRM per peak inverse voltage, PIV, or peak reverse voltage, PRV. Again, VRM is the one we use the most. Breakdown voltage and avalanche voltage are a voltage above the safe maximum that cause the diode to break down, high values of reverse current to flow, and the destruction of the diode. This is called avalanche current. A diode's maximum reverse bias rating can range from a few volts to a several thousand. Okay, so again, these are the ratings we don't want to exceed the current max and that avalanche voltage. We don't want to reach that. So that's our VRM or the maximum reverse uh, repetitive. So again, that's where the when the diode is. This whole section here is when we're reverse biased. Okay, so that voltage is sitting across that diode, and we can't see too much, or it will. Uh, again, be at the expense of the diode. Um, okay, so diode types, um, they're available in a wide variety of shapes, current ratings, voltage ratings, mounting methods. Some are also available with specialized characteristics for non-standard applications. One method of categorizing them is by their physical shape. The current rating of the diode generally determines both its shape and the way it's mounted. So diodes have three current ratings, low, medium, and high. Okay, so we can see these examples of the axial stud mount power module, hockey puck style. We'll go through those ones. Low current, uh, these are the ones we're going to see the most uh, when we hook up our labs. We will see these guys too in some of our um, battery chargers and welders too. But um, again, 3 amps or less. Uh, low current dials resemble a half watt resistor and usually mounted by soldering them into a circuit. Um, the cathode is usually identified by a colored or silver bar, okay, because we'd have to know which one's the cathode and which one's the anode in order to put this in the circuit properly. Uh, medium current diodes are usually stud mounted. Diode in the figure below is a stud mounted 100 amp, so we do have these in our battery chargers. This is a heat sink that it's mounted onto to help dissipate the heat. Um, they could also be press fit diodes, so these are press fit right onto a um, heat sink again to kind of help again dissipate that heat from the diode because there is current going through those so they do create a lot of heat. Um, so it does talk about heat sinks here. Um, something specific we want to really mention for calculations here. So again before that though the diode gets physically larger as the current rating increases just as conductors cross-sectional area increases so must the cross-section of the diode to keep internal resistance to a minimum and to minimize the heating of the diode. Uh, again, the manufacturers usually identify the anode and cathode terminals by printing a small diode symbol on the case of the diode. The stud uh, side of the stud mounted diode can either be anode or cathode. Okay, so you want to watch and make sure, again, you're installing that correctly if that's one, if you're the one doing it. Heat sinks, again, they're uh, basically to help pull heat away from the diode. Um, heat energy is readily conducted away, then dissipated to the surrounding air. To get the power in watts dissipated by the diode, multiply the average current by the average forward biased voltage of the diode. If the diode is operating at rate of current, we use 1 volt instead of 0.7 volts for the calculation. So if you had your current going through, you want to find the watts, P equals I times E. So you take your current times um, your uh, voltage, again it's that... Uh, the forward bias, that's what the diodes, while it's conducting, this is what it's going to draw, okay? It's kind of, it's the same voltage that it takes to get over the barrier potential, but they're going to say for calculations, we're going to go to one volt here instead of 0.7. So use one volt if you're doing calculations for wattage.
Okay, the fins of the heat sink increase the surface area. When mounting this type of diode, a thermal joint compound is often applied between the two surfaces to help the heat transfer. Thermal joint compound ensures there are no microscopic air gaps between the surfaces or you'd get extreme heat buildup there. Aluminum is heat, uh, aluminum sorry, is used as heat sink due to its good heat transfer properties and resistance to, corro to corrosion. Heat sinks are most effective when mounted vertically to make use of the chimney effect in which air uh, moves by convection over the fins, so the hot air rises. Sometimes fans are incorporated to assist in the cooling. Okay. Um, they will, these press fit diodes too, I think they did talk about, um, there's one of them that talks about torquing down, I think that's coming up here anyways. Okay, so high current diodes, last current rating diodes are available in a shape called hockey puck. These diodes may or may not be marked to indicate polarity. They are mounted by tightly squeezing them between two conducting metal plates, also function as heat sinks. The hockey puck details indicate the pressure or clamping force. So you could have to use a torque wrench to do that, depending on what the um, uh, what the specs are. Okay, so it's, it could have a torque setting on there too. Uh, if it's too loose or too tight, it could cause problems. Okay, so I want to make sure that it is not over tightened. Um, the heat sink in figure six comes complete with a torque indicator, so a torque wrench is not necessary. Okay, but this indicator is going to show us what uh, foot pounds are at so they do need to be torqued they're just saying with this indicator here you might not actually have to use a torque wrench if you didn't have one because that uh, that indicating line there is going to be able to assist you instead of that uh, electrical ratings uh, most important ratings of a diode are followed your or are follows sorry maximum forward bias average current Okay, again, we don't want to ex exceed that. That's another name for IF max. The repetitive reverse maximum. Again, that's the safe voltage it can withstand while in the open or reverse bias situation. Maximum instantaneous forward surge current is the current that the dial can withstand occasionally but not repetitively. This is obviously many times higher because um, you're only supposed to see it for a short time. Forward volt drop and rated current. Uh, the theoretical volt drop across the PN junction using silicon has been given 0.7 to 1 because the diode has a very small internal resistance and the volt drop goes up slightly as current increases. So that's why we're using the 1 instead of the 0.7 for those wattage calculations. When replacing the diode, you must take into consideration the peak value of the alternating current to be rectified. This reverse voltage rating can be listed as voltage repetitive reverse maximum or voltage peak reverse. So again, it's the maximum value that that diode's gonna see. So if we're being given an RMS, we're gonna have to calculate to get the peak or the max. So that's what this is saying. So if we have a 240 volt AC supply and we have a diode in there that's gonna see this 240 volt AC, we have to have an understanding that that is an RMS and it's actually gonna see almost 340 volts because that's the peak. Okay, so we took 240, which is our RMS, divided by 0 0.707, which is the sine of 45, and we found our max or our peak. This is what the diode sees when it's a open switch or when it's reverse biased. So it has to be rated to see that. So it means that the VRM of the diode must be greater than this value to rectify that safely. So it's got to be rated to see at least this, okay, um, in order to safely rectify that voltage. Checking a diode, again, we use a multimeter or a component tester. Use a multimeter, you must have a diode check range. So, uh, when set on this range, the multimeter applies only enough forward bias voltage for the meter to direct a small amount of current, typically 0.5 amps. So this is a function of your meter that you'd have to have. You turn on your power to the diode circuit, isolate one lead of the diode to eliminate any parallel paths, identify the anode and cathode, for the small axial type, the cathode is indicated by a stripe. Perform the forward bias check of the diode by touching the positive lead to the anode and the negative to the cathode. Okay, so just like here, negative to the cathode, positive to the anode. If the meter has a beep, it should beep once and stop. The display should read the following, or sorry, the forward base bias voltage the meter had produced 
to detect a small amount of current. Again, typically that 0.5 milliamps. So this is the voltage it had to put through, so almost at that 0.7. Okay, so that's checking, make sure the diode is good in forward bias. To form a reverse bias check, take the positively to the cathode and the negatively to the anode. If the multimeter has a beep, there should be no sound and the display should be an open circuit. This display typically reads OL for over limit, diode acts like an open switch. So that's what we would expect to see if we had an open circuit. During the checks, you may encounter a faulty diode, which generally fails open or short. If the diode is open, it will read OL for both tests. If it's shorted, the meter will display the same value when the leads are touched together. But 1% of the time a diode will test right with a multimeter and fail under load. In that case, the diode's faulty operation can only be detected with an oscilloscope or voltmeter. Replacing them, basically we just got to make sure we have the exact same values for the original that we're using for the replacement. Okay, so make sure if you're the one doing it you, that all these values are the same just like as if you were replacing a fuse or anything like that. Applications, diode application is the same for all general purpose diodes. Diodes conduct current in one direction but not the other as we've stated. Despite operating in the same manner, diodes are given different descriptions based on the types of circuit in which they are used. Three common diodes are freewheeling, directional, and rectifier. So freewheeling, the first one we're going to talk about when, an open uh, when opening a circuit with inductors, there will be a voltage spike across the open switch when the magnetic field collapses around the coil. This amount of CEMF can even be higher than the applied voltage. So when we have this DC circuit, we have this coil, okay, there's a magnetic field that develops around that coil. And with DC, it's just going to stay there, built and ready, uh, magnetized until the switch opens. Then the field uh, basically collapses and sends voltage back to the circuit, okay? It's counter to the voltage of the supply, but it sends it back and can arc across this open switch and destroy components. So we use a freewheeling diode um, to help provide an alternative path when that switch is open so that it doesn't arc there. So what happens is in, during regular operation, this freewheeling diode would be reverse bias. So our positive would be here, on the cathode and negative on the anode, so we'd be reverse bias. So during regular operation, this diode is in parallel, but it's not even part of the circuit because this is like an open switch. Okay, so it's basically no no path for current to flow here. When this collapses, though, we can see that the current, so the current from the supply through the load is going this way. When it collapses, it's going the other way. Well, as soon as the current is from the collapsing field, because it's, again, counter to this, then that forward biases this diode because the polarity changes across it. At that point, it does create a path and helps basically dissipate that current through back through the inductor as opposed to arcing over the switch. Okay, so that's kind of the long and short of it, is that in the, in the original position, it's not even in the circuit because it's reverse biased. As soon as we have that collapse, then the current is going the other direction. Then it becomes forward bias and conducting, and it just creates a separate circuit here, and then, again, alleviates the fact that we could have arcing over the switch. Okay, they're also known as suppression or protection diodes. Common for inductive circuits, method cannot be used for AC loads because the diode would be forward biased every half cycle. So this is a DC supply. Obviously, if this was AC, it would be forward, then reverse, forward, then reverse, forward, and it would conduct during half the cycle. So we can't use the, this type of scenario for an AC supply, only for DC. Directional or blocking diodes. Um, where, okay, so diodes, again, only allow current to flow in one direction, but not the other. Diodes in these applications may be called directional, blocking, steering, or isolating. The arrow in the symbol points in the direction of current flow. Okay, so we have our positive here. So again, we are positive here on all this, all the uh, anodes of these diodes here. And just like this point here, okay, so if we're positive here and negative here, it's reverse bias. If we're positive here, 
negative here, be forward biased. So the figure below shows the generators charging four batteries. The diodes allow charge current from the DC generator to the four batteries. Okay, so if this is positive, again, with respect to this side, their current flow it comes from the generator and goes through all these forward bias diodes into the batteries to charge them. If the diodes were not present, the current would be able to travel from battery to battery. So I can't have this, let's say these batteries, um, these ones were all the same, but this one was higher. This one, if they were didn't have diodes, would try to charge these ones and bring them up all to the same value. But these diodes going this way would be reverse bias. So I, the batteries cannot back feed into the circuit. The only way um, current comes through is from the generator to each individual battery. So it's kind of isolating the batteries and not allowing them to flow back into the circuit. Um, these diodes prevent the battery with the highest voltage action like a power source and discharging to the other batteries. When the generator is off, the diodes prevent current from a fully charged battery from flowing into a battery that is not fully charged. The diodes also prevent the batteries from discharging through the DC generator when it's shut down. Okay, so if this wasn't here and the generator wasn't running, there is a set of windings in here, could act as a load and add the batteries to charge or a discharge through there, which we also would not want. Okay. And then figure below shows how diodes can be used to isolate batteries. The circuit uses two stud type diodes mounted on a heatsink. This arrangement is called an isolating kit. The simplified circuit should be used in a vehicle charging system. The alternator output is rectified and is of pulsing DC nature. Okay, so here's my alternator here. And we got our pulsating DC coming out of there. Um, DC supply charges each battery through its corresponding isolating diode. Okay, so it's coming through here, being forward bias, charging this battery, forward bias, charging this battery for this load too. Okay, so two separate batteries. Uh, the charging current for each battery depends on the battery's terminal voltage and the internal resistance. If the alternator is not charging the batteries, battery one is fully charged and battery two supplies load two and discharges. Battery one cannot supply load two as the left diode is reverse biased and will not allow current to flow. Battery 1 can supply load 1, the vehicle starter, and the vehicle can be started. The alternator can now charge both batteries through the forward bias diodes. So basically what they're saying is, is this battery is doing this load, this battery doing this load. They will not back feed and, and uh, charge the, the load aside from the one that it's associated directly with. Okay, so that's the uh, way it can be isolated. So diodes block current and provide battery isolation to prevent one load from discharging both batteries. And they're called isolating or blocking. Um, the next one they go through, again, go through this scenario. These are diodes that steer the current through either the off or off coil or the on coil of a relay. They are called steering or directional diodes. So again, when we're on here, so we're in the on position. So this switch would be up here. We have a path from our transformer going through the eye, uh, the on switch, through the forward uh, bias diode D5. Then it's going to either go through D2 or D1. D2 is reverse bias. D1 is forward, so it goes through D1, energizes the uh, coil, and then returns back. So then that would close that set of contacts and turn the light on. So again, steering current through this path. In the off position then, I have now current flowing the, uh, when the push button one is off, the current flows from X2 to X1. So I'm going back through here now, through this now that's forward biased, where it was reverse biased again in the other scenario. Come back through here, again through this forward bias section, through the this switch would be in the off position and back to X1. Okay, so you can just use them to, to steer. Um, this scenario on the bottom is the exact same. There's just two push buttons. Okay, so this is the on scenario and this is the off scenario. So what it's saying is current flows from X1 to X2 in the one scenario and then from X2 to um, X1 in the other scenario. Okay, so this would be an example of steering or directional. Another application, fire alarm bells um, using a signaling circuit. A DC signal circuit of the system has one polarity during non-alarm conditions. Okay, so basically 
I have my path is going through the end of line resistor, which is what the fire alarm panel is going to read. When it goes into um, an alarm condition, so now a sensing device has, say a smoke detector or heat detector has sensed an, a condition, the panel reverses the polarity to the bells and the diodes that were reverse bias now are forward bias and start to um, um, ring the bells. Okay, so again, they at the one point they were reverse biased, then the panel literally switches the polarity and they become forward biased. So during normal conditions, again, it's reversed. Uh, during alarm conditions, it's forward biased current flows and the signal device sounds. Okay, so that's another um, application. Photodiodes, again, photodiodes is a PN junction that it's connected in reverse bias into a circuit. So not a photo cell, this is a photo diode, so a totally different symbol. There's a diode right there. And it's only used in DC application. The figure below shows two symbols of a photo diode. So don't get those um, mixed up between the photo cell. Diode allows a small current when no light is applied. It's called dark current and is negligible for most applications. When light energy is applied to the diode, its resistance decreases, allowing current to flow. The current increases as the light increases. So a photodiode has a dark current of around 25 microamps at a reverse bias voltage of 3 volts. So its dark resistance can be calculated, again, at about 120,000 ohms. Um, it has a light current, so there's a difference between dark current and light current, of 375 microamps at a reverse bias voltage of 3 volts. So the light resistance is significantly less. Photodiodes can be used in various applications, such as counting objects on a conveyor belt, where each object on the belt blocks a beam of light as it passes. And the last thing to talk about is LEDs or light emitting diodes. Um, again, when an electron moves across PN junction, it releases some energy as it goes from a higher energy level to a lower one. In silicon, this energy is mainly radiated as infrared wavelength senses heat. LEDs are made of gallium arsenic phosphate or gallium phosphate. In these materials, the energy is released um, instead of by heat, it's mainly shorter wavelength and senses visible light. So because, the, of, because of this phenomenon, an LED emits light when forward current flows. Gallium arsenic phosphate produces a red or yellow, while gallium phosphate produces red or green. Other combinations of materials can produce ultraviolet, blue, white, orange, and purple. Typical forward operating voltages are 1.8 to 2.2 volts. And forward current rings are approximately 15 milliamps to 30 milliamps. The maximum power dissipated for these devices is approximately 80 um, milliwatts to 100 milliwatts. Again, these do not give off a lot of heat. Super bright, no heat. Okay, so that's what makes them so efficient. Um, even to a point, I when they switched from LEDs on vehicles, I had a buddy that's heavy duty mechanic, and he said, you know, some of the truckers were complaining because they they would get covered in ice because the normal lights would heat up and melt the snow and ice off them, but these don't. Okay, obviously their advantage is that they're super bright though, and cheap uh, and efficient. Okay, and, and again, watch this here, light emitting. So the arrows are different than they are here, than the photodiode. Okay, so watch that stuff. Those little differences are gonna make, uh, make everything. Okay, so, oh, rectifier uh, dials. These are the most common application. This is basically what our whole next ILM is about. Okay, they're using rectify, rectifier circuits to convert AC into DC by conducting in one direction, not the other, thereby converting alternate current into direct current. Okay, so our next <coughs> ILM, we're going to get right into the rectification process, and that's where we're going to use our, our diodes for. Okay, so... Hopefully that helps you understand how to break it up into a bunch of videos there. But again, if you got questions, just let me know.